Do 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 theme song. Do 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 I'm broke, so this is my theme song. Do 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 just imagine this is an awesome theme song. Do do theme song. Hello, welcome to Left of the Box, Let's Chat. Bonjour, bienvenue, I'm Sandy. I just wrapped up my conversation with the letter hack. I have been looking forward to having this chat with him for a long time. As some of you, some of my regular viewers may recall, him and I met on Twitter through art. I have a video about it. I'll link it below in the box, in the description box, so you can go back and see it if you like. And he really helped me get my art back and that had a profound change in my life so we've been chatting a lot on twitter and it's great he's a wonderful guy i sent him a drawing of his dog as a way of th saying thank you to him for the gift he helped me find so stay tuned to the end of the chat where he will open it up for the first time and see it with his own eyeballs we had a fantastic conversation talking about art and online etiquette and issues. Oddly enough, we stayed away from politics, which we were both kind of thinking we would be talking about, but we have more content for next time then, or more subjects to talk about next time. So before I start rambling, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, Become a Patreon, link in the description box below. Every little bit helps me to sustain this channel. And follow me and Letterhack on Twitter. Enjoy the discussion. Hello everyone, I'm Sandy from Left of the Box. You know that because you're already on my video. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the Letterhack. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to finally meet you. So we have... Yeah a history already mm -hmm. sort of yeah. via twitter and so i know you a lot on twitter but this is my first time actually talking to you yeah it's weird <laughs> uh so just to give some of my viewers a quick rundown of how we kind of met in the twitterverse um i was watching the majority report and sam was mentioning something about this guy on twitter asking people for his birthday he wanted people to draw pictures of the mr crew well sam in particular and the mr crew and i think at that point i had seen a couple of your posts kind of pop up with the cartoons and stuff like that so i went and looked at you and i'm like oh okay i have at that time i thought i completely lost my ability to do art like it was just gone I had tried over the years and failed and there's a detailed video about my experiences with this where I actually go over how we met in more detail. The short of it is I thought why not give it a try I'll try drawing a picture of Sam Cedar and see what happens and what happened was incredible. I. I didn't just do a good drawing I did a phenomenal drawing considering that I hadn't done anything for about 10 years. So oh wow. Yeah. I, I may have heard that it was 10 years previously, but I forgot that. That's a long time to not do something that I assume you love to do. Yeah, because it was what was happening is I would start drawing and it wouldn't be turning out. And then that heartbreak of losing my skill would just kind of be amplified in that moment. And I would have to be in the right headspace. And since I have a history of mental health and depression, to attempt to do that and have that disappointment when in a low spot is just not a good mix. So yes. I would often just hold back trying. <clears throat> Sorry. It never ceases to amaze me how when I'm actually recording videos, I get a frog in my throat and yet I can talk anytime I want in my apartment without any issues. No, I was choking on a sip of coffee live on YouTube the other day. <laughs> yeah. And pretending you're not mm -hmm. is really awkward. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I drew the picture of Sam and it just kind of blew my mind. And from there, I've been drawing since. And the drawings that I just have are, I can't 
believe how good they are. Like they astonish me, but I still run into the problem that every time I start doing the drawing, I have to be a good third of the way into it before I know if it's actually going to turn out. And before then it tends to just look like crap. And I think that's part of the reason why I would stop so many times before is that I would hit a certain point and it just wasn't looking good. And so I thought, okay, I can't do it as opposed to just pushing through it. And I think it's because I was doing it more or less for someone else, as opposed to just me, that mm. got me to push past that. Why don't we just take this to the full extent, like just finish it and see what happens? Because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe it will be so bad it's good, as opposed to so good it's amazing type thing. Um, and now, um, some people know I drew a couple portraits of Michael Brooks, one to give to his sister and one to give to Sam. And I look at those portraits that I've done. And so I rediscovered my talent in December. I look at those portraits compared to the first portrait I did Sam. And now Sam's portrait just looks bad because <laughs> it my doesn't, skill though. has improved yeah. that much. Like I, so, I look at it like I need to redo Sam's portrait now because that one just looks almost childish compared to what I've okay. just done. I have to get in here because this is this happens to be one of my favorite topics. Um, I I don't know if you know this. I I spent a few years teaching art um, in aftercare programs. Um, I, I don't know if you call them that in Canada. In the U.S., when you're done with school, you can hang out for an hour and take like another course that has nothing to do with your regular school day. It's really just a way of like giving you educational opportunity, but also fun, um, making it fun while you wait for your parents to get off work. And so I would go to schools when they when everyone else leaves and I'd have a handful of kids, five to 20 middle schoolers. And, you know, these are like 10 to 14 year old kids. And I would teach them art, specifically how to make comics. I would also do entire panels at Comic Cons where I was invited to talk to people about um, exactly what you're saying. You have no, we call it self-doubt. Um, I call it self-loathing. It's what all artists experience to a degree. Some of them find it very easy to get over right away. Some of them never get over it. And sometimes it can, it can keep you from, from, like in your case, you could spend 10 years not doing any art, right? And so people go, wow, you're so good. And I'm like, actually, I'm not good. I'm horrible. I have hack in my nickname for a reason because I'm hacking my way in. I have no formal training. Every time I draw something, I absolutely hate it until it's done. And only then do I feel like it might be good enough, but it's not what I saw in my head. This is why the majority of people stop drawing or creating art around 11, 12 years old, because that's, um, you know, I don't have like a source for this, but, but from what I understand, that's the part of um, human development where you're like, hey, uh, what I'm creating doesn't look like what I imagined in my mind and you give up. And so I would specifically teach kids at that age and the whole thing would be focused on yeah of course it doesn't look how you imagined it every time you draw it's just practice for the next time so here now we we find a new rule that that i i don't know if i created this but i use it a lot finished not perfect you have to complete your project no matter how you feel about it and move on to the next one in order to improve. Guess what? You may never improve to your own satisfaction. You may never get to a point where you say, I did it, I'm the artist I always thought I could be. That might not happen. The best, most famous artists were always experiencing the same thing that we're talking about right now. Although you gotta assume they had some confidence because they had done, you know, 100 magazine covers or they were getting paid lots of money right so that would help boost your confidence a little bit to have an audience but if you don't have an audience and it's just for yourself 
then that self-doubt can be overwhelming. And so what I always tell people is do not, and, and this goes for adults, kids, everyone, do not sit down to draw the final product. Sit down to mess with it. Sit down to sketch it. Just focus on drawing ears over and over, draw the eyes over and over, and then go back and do the full composition. But in the meantime, do things that prevent you from having those thoughts versus diving in, dealing with the thoughts, all the negativity that, that we put on ourselves as creators or creative people until you're done, quote unquote done, which we know is, is going to be compromised because of the compromises you made mentally or emotionally along the way. It's all perfectly natural. It's not something that should be avoided, but I tried to give them tools to deal with it. And I go, okay, today we're just going to mess around with the idea. We are not going to sit down and draw it. And you would get a few people who would just sit down and draw it. And you're like, all right, well, you're doing it to yourself now, right? Yeah. There's, different, there's different steps you can take that help you ease into it, but it's always going to be there. So I, I appreciate that you're so honest about it because that's one of the things that like a lot of artists think this is just me. It's wrong to feel this way. If I was any kind of an artist, I would just be able to put my pen to paper and knock it out. And that's just not the case. Like I know every time I've started a new drawing, I still have that apprehension of, I don't know if I can actually do this. So the thing that reminds me is the chain of drawings that I've done so far. So in the video I made about this experience, right after I did the picture of Sam, I'm like, I need to see if this is a one-off. And so I got four photos that I did and I went on to draw those photos and when I would still be in that phase of, I don't know if I can do this. I would just look back at that photo that I did of Sam and be like, I just drew that. Right. Like I yes. just it, drew that. Yeah. If I can do that, I can do this one too. And that's what I'm constantly having to rely on right now because I still have incredible doubt that the picture will turn out when I start. And it's, again, I have to get to at least a third or a halfway through before I can actually feel, okay, this is coming together. Mm -hmm. And so until then, there's a little apprehension, but I'm starting to relax about the process. The more I do it, the more drawings I've done. And then the last two portraits I did of Michael, they were just, it's so hard to explain because you can't just take a picture of a pencil drawing and post it. It doesn't look the same. The light yeah, doesn't pick up looked, lead and stuff. And so they looked hard. really good though. They were fantastic. Like, is that, is that what you're saying? Like you were happy with them or not happy with them? Both. This is a problem that I run into all the time. I look at them and I'm like, these are amazing. At the same time, I'm terrified they're not good. So it's almost like you can recognize you did better than you thought you would. It's probably better than your last attempt. Do you, you still want to be better? I got to tell you, that's that feels like it could be everyone doing everything. Like I used to work with professional athletes. I worked with the most decorated um, downhill skier in history. And she would tell me, Every season, I feel like I forgot how to ski. Every season, I'm nervous. I'm not going to do it right. And I'm like, you're the greatest skier of all time. What are you talking about? And she would say, I can't get over it. I travel to different parts of the world so I can ski in the off season. But there's always a period where I'm not skiing just long enough to feel like I'm not good at it anymore. And so, um, you know, it's like. Elvis Presley got butterflies every time he went on stage. Really? Come on. There, you can literally be terrible at this and they'll love you for it. And it didn't matter because some people just hold themselves to a higher standard. And you almost wish that was everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people should hold themselves to a higher standard in various professions and they just don't. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, I'm still... I have a hard time understanding how people perceive me and the things I do. Like I just, it doesn't compute. 
so I've sent you the drawing, which we're going to open up later, of um, because I wanted to offer you a drawing, and you graciously declined the first few drawings that I did. And I'm like, oh yeah, well you just wait. And so I patiently <laughs> waited until you posted a picture of your dog, and then I took that and I was like, ha, huh, you can't say no to this one. Can't I couldn't. <laughs> and I just for the record, I'm bad at receiving gifts, especially if somebody has to ship them internationally during a pandemic. Yeah, and. Um, <laughs> I'm horrible at it too. Like I've asked people, I'd love to see your reaction, but if you ask me to do the same thing, no, it's a hard no. I can't. Oh, I get too much that's anxiety. Not fair. <laughs> yeah, I get too much anxiety over how I'm supposed to react. And I don't necessarily react the same way normal humans do. And so I so, get so what do you mean? anxious. Like if I sent you a drawing and you already saw it and you loved it, then when you get it in reality, you might respond to it like, like I may perceive that you don't like it. Yeah, like there's a certain expectation, like you want the person to like it. So you're hoping for like this over the top reaction or tears or something of that oh, sort. You yeah. know, like there's some people that are expecting that when they give something, they feel yeah. like I nailed this gift. You know, you're going oh, like no. this. I know this. And so then I get anxious because I have a hard time hiding if I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's. That can be terrifying. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I can't tell you how many times I give somebody a commission that they paid for. And I'm like, well, if they don't like it, I'll just keep drawing it. Until yeah. They do. Cause, yeah. And I just, so it really stresses me. And so right now I kind of have that same fear that when you open up the drawing, um, I probably won't be seeing Sam or Leisha open up their drawings, but there's this sense of what if they're disappointed with it? Like what if, what if my art isn't as good as I think it is in my head? Because of course I'm online and I see other people do drawings that are just phenomenal. And I'm like, oh, I'm nowhere near that. But then my logic brain kind of clicks in and says, first of all, you're doing a pencil drawing. They're doing a canvas in blank, like a different medium. And your drawings look exactly like the person. <laughs> you know, oh, how much I... better do you want this? No, yeah, I can tell you. I, I... Your your pencil drawings are, and it, it bugs me out. Some people call them pencil sketches. It's so much more than that. Your your art is um, a a high standard for for that type of art for people doing stuff with pencil. You've set a standard that people should should try to meet. Um, there's no way anyone would ever look at this stuff and be disappointed with it unless that was coming from their own hangups or there's just something about them that's uncool which and, can totally happen and that's why whenever i've tweeted about it or even the emails that i've sent them about it i'm trying to reassure them it's like they look better than the image you're seeing on screen even though if i just take myself out of it the image on the screen even though it's not as good as the actual drawing is still really damn good it's and amazing before I sent the drawings of Michael, because there is something else, like, especially the portrait that I gave Leisha, there is just something else about it that is on a different level. Like, I want to say that I felt haunted by it, but not in a bad way. It was a very comforting sense. And I didn't really want to... Isn't that inspiration to yeah. a degree, do you think? It, just, it can it be felt, spiritual. Yeah, it felt like it didn't feel like it was Michael, but it felt like there is a life or a presence to that drawing. And yeah. I didn't want to just have these drawings out of my life forever. So I had to go to a professional art studio to get a professional print done. And oh. thankfully, the they do amazing work. So I'll be using them in the future for sure. Uh, watts studio i'll put a link to them below for anyone who's interested who might happen to live in my area and the prints that they reproduce are just phenomenal uh so i can still have that sense and here's where again i have to remind myself these are good so it's a couple a man and a woman who run the studio and they were there they were impressed by these portraits and it's like, they do this for a living. They have art all the time. Right. They see art all the time. And so 
to impress them with art must mean that it's good. <laughs> but I'm still in the back of my head. I'm worried. What if they're not that great? And I can't, it's part of, again, it's my mental health issues that I deal with on a constant, like, I will believe at the same time, I'm really good at something and I'm really bad at something. I will really like something and I will really hate it. And mm. it's this constant, like, most people achieve a balance in life because like, here's the middle and they're here. But I achieve that balance by being here. So I'm constantly mm. in two states of extremes. And so sometimes that's why it's hard for me to react to things because I don't know which side I'm pulling from necessarily. And a okay. lot of people think I'm extremely nice and I am, I'm very good natured. I'm very nice. I'm very good at compliments and shining that through, but that's balancing out what's happening inside of me a lot of the time. And the I have a question. Do you think I'm a nice person? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, I mean, I often feel like I need to be much nicer to people. <laughs> I think you're nice. You do like these wonderful cartoons and you don't, have I could to. easily hide behind that. Yeah. But you don't have to do them. And generally speaking, they're always good natured, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. because there's lots of political cartoons out there that are just designed to make digs at people or to hurt people in a way. And even when you're kind of insulting people, it's all in, it's ribbing, it's good nature. It's, it's, you're not, you don't come across as trying to hurt anyone. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think they could take it or appreciate it. And, you know, it's like, on the other hand, you got a show you put on YouTube. You just put yourself out there. Somebody's going to, if somebody makes a comic out of you, you could ask them to stop, but it's kind of like an invitation. <laughs> no, I knew this going in. Like I've made a couple of images that I've posted online that have picked up a lot of momentum. And to me, I always find it wild when I see somebody else posting it without any reference to me. Oh yeah. That ha I, mine show up as profile pictures. Mm -hmm. Like somebody started following me and they're like, Oh, I've never seen this guy before. And I'm like, really? That's my art in your profile picture. Somebody Twitter. took one of the portraits I did of Michael and used that as their profile picture. They at least gave me credit in their bio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I kind of assume as soon as I put something out there, it's, it's like out my there. video, it's out there. Like if I see it, I see it. If I don't, I don't. Uh, because I do. I do look at red tube on a regular basis to make sure that they're not because they steal your art all the time. Mm -hmm. And and I've seen my Michael Brooks art on mm -hmm. all kinds of merchandise and they they, they called it a Michael Brooks mm -hmm. tribute. Oh. Yeah, that you stole. And you're making <laughs> and now money profit off. Of off. Yeah, it's yeah. not a tribute no. anymore. So and putting like your own watermark over it enrages me because I do my art for free for the most part unless I have a Kickstarter or, or, and uh, there's a label on it that says how much it costs. I'm putting this stuff in the world for people to have and mm -hmm. move around and share, but yeah. you know, the honor system will only get you so far. <laughs> well, for me, it was more about, especially the, the, there's two images in particular that have gone completely wild online and they're on very extreme opposite ends. And to me, it was more just about getting a certain message out there. Like one was, I did that image of Sam Cedar as Steven Crowder behind the thing uh, with the <laughs> apple on the desk and Steven Crowder is afraid to debate Sam Cedar, change my mind. And I put a lot of work into it because people don't realize I will match the font because there's a certain font that he uses. So I will type out a word that is present on there and match the font and add little waves and wrinkles so that it looks a little bit more natural and adding shadows and putting tones of the colors of the background into whatever image I overlaid on top. Like there's a lot of work that goes into it, but I've seen other people post that meme now and I don't care because to me it was just, I want people to laugh. I want people to be happy with that. And that's what's happening. It's out there in the world. That's great. The other image I did, it's uh, one that I did shortly after the discoveries at the Kamloops residential school of the mass grave. And like a lot of people, my heart was just breaking. So I did this image of 
it's an iceberg and above the water. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, there's the there were three schools in particular that were kind of in the news at that moment. One was the Kamloops. One is St. Anne's because there's a lot of horrendous stories coming out of there, a lot of court like court issues going on right now because Justin Trudeau still thinks it's okay to take survivors of residential schools to court. Um, and another school had just discovered uh, a whole bunch of unmarked graves in Brandon. So I kind of had those on the top, but then underneath are all the other schools. And there's 140 in total. The common number I hear is 139, but the most recent list that I got, it said 140. And one of them does actually mark one is new. So that's probably where it kind of comes in. And so I had to, like all of those school names I had to put on there and everything. And, you know, sometimes in the news I'll see. And since I have it in my Photoshop file, I can easily find the names down the side as opposed to trying to find oh. them on the thing. Yeah. And like that was a very powerful image and i have had a couple people track down who did it to give me credit but to me it was just so much more important that message was out there like that image was out there for people to see this is the scope of what we're dealing with would would you ever um sign it or put some sort of like your twitter handle on there or something i'm thinking i should have done that now <laughs> Like, at least in the bottom corner, just put my Twitter handle or something. I wasn't See, really, I don't. Yeah, I wasn't really I, thinking of it at the time. Because, again, to me, it was just more important to get that image out there and off into the wild. I didn't... Getting credit for it wasn't really... It's not the point. It wasn't the point. And I didn't want the credit. I just wanted this art out there. It's, it's kind of... It's funny, though, because you want people... Like if somebody wanted to hire you to make more of those, you'd want them to know how to get to you for the same reason, because now you can put more of this kind of content out there and spread the awareness. I don't sign anything unless it's part of a spoof. So if it's like I'm doing an image of a um, based on a Norman Rockwell cover, I'll sign it the way Norman Rockwell signs it. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a Peanuts comic i'll sign it the way charles schultz would have signed it mm -hmm. but that's just to keep in theme i'm not doing it so people are like hey i'm the guy yeah. you know it's and and so on the one hand you don't want people to misinterpret a signature but on the other hand you want them to know the the source mm -hmm. so yeah it's 22 yeah i'm still figuring out a lot of my online presence i'm still trying to figure out how to use it how to work it because i held off for an extraordinary long time getting involved in social media and part of it was when social media first started to pick up steam i knew my sarcasm would not translate online i knew it it also, does it, no one said <laughs> really, yeah. also the other hiccup i was running into is i cannot spell to save my life i am a horrendous speller i have dyslexia so spelling is just it's a it's a non-starter for me and back when a lot of these social media sites started there was no automatic spell checkers right and so i would have to dumb down my sentences so much it would almost be like an eight-year-old was talking mm. in order to know i could spell all the words in that sentence and that really kind of held me back from wanting to go on. And I'm very grateful in a way it took me so long because I saw a lot of people do the exact same mistakes I would have done and have it blow up in their face. Like I know yeah, and that's, yeah. that's good of you because you can see a lot of people on social media do not care about grammatical errors mm -hmm. or misspelled words they don't care. They, they don't have that, but that shows that you have a certain respect for yourself, other people and what you're actually saying. So that's good. Yeah. But, but like, you know, I think social media can be a pretty forgiving place in those regards, whereas it's completely unforgiving in every other regard. 
Yeah, I just, it's, I'm still trying to figure out the etiquettes, how to work it, you know, what's okay, what's not okay. And this is, it's kind of like, again, part of the reason why I didn't want to do it is I have troubles figuring these things out. Like when I was working in an office, thankfully my boss was also my best friend. We had known each other outside of there beforehand. And when he recommended the position for me, he didn't even know he would be my boss. It was oh. just the higher up managers is like, okay, she's reporting to you. And it's like, what? <laughs> and it's like, this is weird. Um, I had to rely on him a lot of the times to ask what is the appropriate reaction to blank? Like somebody just announced they're pregnant. What is the normal human reaction to that? And some people might be like, what, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I don't know because there's like literally millions of reactions. There's lots of reactions. You mean like what's what's the socially acceptable reaction? Yeah, what's the socially what what are appropriate questions? Because like immediately, just given my past has not been a good past. And so there's things like running through my mind and it's like, is this a wanted pregnancy? Or did this person become pregnant through something traumatic and you remind them of it Can and you it's horrendous? Or this pregnancy? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, in Canada, that's not so much of an issue. Oh, okay. gotcha. Uh, but the other issue is, can you afford to raise the child? That's yeah, still that, an issue yeah. here. But the actual birth, not so much. Um, and so there's all these questions. It's like, so what if I go and congratulate this person? It's like, yay, you're having a baby. And meanwhile, they're thinking, ah, like I don't want this baby. I don't know what to do. And so many people are also afraid to acknowledge sometimes that they got pregnant and they don't want the child. And they'll still have the child, they'll still love the child, care for the child, but the cold hard truth is if they could go back and do it again, they might not have. And those are some of the things I find people are afraid to talk about, but I have a hard time not talking about truths. Like this is a person's truth, not talking about it doesn't help that person, it doesn't help other people who might be in that situation. Like if any, if I were to ever get pregnant and somebody were to congratulate me, they'd be getting punched in the face. Like it's just because I have gone to extreme lengths to make sure I never get pregnant. So if it happens, I have some doctors I'm about to sue. Yeah, there's a lot of like, um, uh, there's a lot of situations like that, that I, I think I'm known as the guy who could potentially say the wrong thing. And so people brush it off. Mm -hmm. I get a pass. But um, it's not because I didn't didn't consider their feelings or something. It's just I considered it and decided I don't care. <laughs> this is why I asked you if you thought I was a nice person, because more often than not, I'll say something funny because I think it's funny. I don't care if people laugh. I draw pictures because I want to draw it. I don't care if people like it or not. I'm glad they do but it's not going to keep me from doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I have this real, like, like, um, I guess I decided early on in, in life, like in my youth that, Hey, I'm going to get mine one way or another. And I don't mean, you know, I'm not going to be the one to die with the most toys or the most cash or something like that. I'm going to be the guy that has fun in life. And I'm not going to let those things hold me back. Although it's easier said than done. Really, be especially especially like on social media or trying to be on, you know, quote unquote, on the left. Um, you don't want to be terminally online. You don't want to be inconsiderate online. But how considerate do you need to be online? And it's just the dynamics are um, undefined as of now. And it's been going for a while. And I don't think this is ever going to be an experiment where people say this is the point where it worked mm -hmm. or this is the point where everyone knew what to do. And so if you take the dynamics of being online and the duration that we've all been online for now, particularly with social media or message boards or, or whatever it is, that stuff is going to spill over into real life. And so now it's affected the dynamics of real life to the point where you're like, if I was online, I would say this, but in person, I might say this. Well, those are awkward decisions. 
And, and that conflict in my mind, I'm not dealing with that. Mm -hmm. I don't care. And if somebody gets mad at me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I'll, I'll do whatever I can to make amends. But at the end of the day, I've made my mind up <laughs> that I'm proceeding this way. And I think people realize that about me. I'm known at work as the guy who says what everyone's thinking. And in my mind, it's like, well, if you're thinking it, why didn't you say it? Because you made an, a judgment call that I refuse to make. <laughs> I'm not, I've run I'm not into troubles it. with that sort of thing too, myself, where it's like, I just state the obvious and people get so upset. Oh, well, yeah, but um, I think you'll be able to move on. Yeah. And some people, you know, especially given my mental health background, they might be thinking like, why on earth am I diving into online media? Like I'm making videos and putting myself out there. And to me, it's partly, I do have a really thick skin to some extent, if I know someone is trying to hurt me or insult me, it will never work. Because to me, it just becomes more about that person and what they're trying to do. So if somebody just calls me a mean name or is attacking me, or even threatening me, it's like, yeah, so I don't care. The only way that I can really be hurt by someone is generally I have to care about them. And they have to do it accidentally. And those are the times that I can get hurt. But if somebody just wants to call me names online or to say horrible things, I really, really don't care because. Well, OK, let me ask you this, though, in terms of artistic inspiration, because you talked about that already. Um, does it have to be positive inspiration or can you be inspired artistically like the, the meme you made about the schools? That wasn't like a positive thing, but you were inspired to create from that. So do you ever use that as like a mechanism for dealing? I don't know if that's the right word, but is it a tool for you to um, um, process emotions in, in terms of like, okay, I've been um, inspired by something that is by all rights a negative thing, but I'm going to turn it around and expose them and spread awareness, which is a positive thing. Are those, are those tools that you can use like outside of artistic inspiration, like in everyday conversation? I don't know. Well, a lot of my videos, they're all inspired by negative things, really. <laughs> uh, but, but I that's do, like, that's I, commentary and yeah, analysis. But right? I add my humor, I add my wit to it. Because I find sometimes, again, these are the things we need to talk about that nobody's talking about. And sometimes it's because it's too dark, it's too depressing. And so by adding that humor into it, adding that humanity into it, makes it so people can actually stomach the content a little bit more and actually hear some of what's going on. Because I know it's so easy to just want to put your head in the sand and forget that anything is happening. And meanwhile, it's like the world is burning around us. We don't no, have I, that option. That's not the easiest way out. Get this. The easiest thing to do, and this is the wrong thing to do, if you ask me, I do not subscribe to this, but I have seen people who put forth the same or less effort on art than I do, and they're far more successful to the point of being profitable because it's all negative, hateful stuff. They only go, I go after what I love. They go after what they hate and they are wildly popular. Now, some of that following, like if you look at somebody's number of followers on Twitter or Facebook or something, that could be from like part of their audience might be people that are critiquing them. You know, um, like uh, we know that people who don't like Fox News watch Fox News all the time because they're going to comment on it later. But um, but the amount of like Patreon support or retweets or something that people get from negative content is, is to me taking the easy way out. Having like that reaction and actually being able to pay your rent or your bills from being putting negativity in the world is the easiest thing to do in the world. And I think it's cheap and a cop out and art 
Yeah, okay, you can have a commentary that's occasionally negative, you know, like political cartoons or editorial cartoons on any topic. You can go after certain people, but if all you do is negative, 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 hate, 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 and you benefit from that, you should stick your head in the sand. <laughs> yeah, I never... Like have a timeout, like a forced yeah, timeout. <laughs> I've never been able to really... Like I can wrap my head around it and I can't. Because again, I sit here on the balance scale and right now I'm on the good side. Times in my life, I was really close to being on the other side. And all as good as I come across and the positive change I'm trying to kind of help with the world, I could have just as easily been just as horrible and be a sellout and stuff. But thankfully, I have integrity. I have I have too much empathy, I think, at times because I feel for other people so much sometimes it hurts. And that was just a, a course my life went on a long time ago. And I say this in one of my videos, but not everyone's watching all my videos yet. Hey, get on it, people. If you haven't seen all my videos yet, there's not that yeah. many. Get caught what are you up. Doing? Uh, <laughs> I but, fully endorse those videos, by the way. <laughs> back when I was in about grade nine and I could see a lot of my peers starting to change to be what they thought they should be what society wanted them to be I remember just thinking to myself I'd rather be alone and miserable for the rest of my life than to conform and be something I'm not just to fit in sure hence I've been alone and miserable for most of my life <laughs> but it's just it's not in me to be something other than me and to bring this negativity into the world. Why? Like I see things on Twitter sometimes and I could add on the attack. I could say something to really be negative. And sometimes I do some sarcastic digs on people, but I don't need to. And there's still going to be plenty of negativity in the world. You have to work at being good. It doesn't come without you know, hiccups, it doesn't come without a lot of pain. It's hard to do. Which is probably why we don't see as many of them, because you do get beaten down. You do get told you're doing good wrong. <laughs> you know, there's lots yeah. of people who are trying to make a difference and then one little mess up and they're done. And that's where mm. I'm kind of tiptoeing right now because I'm still new enough at this. I don't have enough of a following or a fan base that if I do a minor screw up now, it can end me on here. Like if you're trying your best and everyone's saying not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I hate the most about being online or social media is I'll draw a picture of 60, 68 people in one, one illustration. And everyone's like, you, you didn't draw this one person. This is horrible. And I'm like, good grief. So you'd rather a drawing of one person <laughs> than 60 or 70. Come on. Like, it's just, I, I saw um, a comic the other day where a person travels back in time to tell themselves. <clears throat> it, it's like, they go back six years and they go, I just wanted to let you know, um, you know, they introduce themselves as being from the future. And they say, I just want to let you know, it, not everything in the world was created for you. So if you don't like it, that doesn't mean it was bad. It just means it's not for you. And the version in the past is like, why are you telling me this? And he goes, oh, because in, in a very short time, there's going to be this thing called Twitter. <laughs> and you're going to have to keep this in mind. And it's like, this is this should have been like a thing when you're signing up for Twitter right before they let you in. It has this big statement that takes over your whole screen. Not everything is for you, buddy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of this stuff is not for you mm -hmm. don't rail and oh. that and that message has been lost almost immediately luckily i haven't run into too much of that yet like i will have people say oh i don't like your theme song or you know or just <sighs> i don't like blank that's that's flat out wrong whoever said that they are wrong awesome they don't theme like your song. theme song i have an awesome theme song um that's a great theme song it's but, you know what? Some people just have to be negative. <laughs> yeah. And so I, 
You know, a lot of people, so I haven't been getting a lot of that criticism yet of like, oh, well, what you should be doing. There's been right. slight times like when I've changed my logo and stuff. It's like, well, what you should have done. And to me, my response to that always will be, if you don't like how I do my show, do your own. Right. Exactly. This is actually exactly. part of the reason why I started my channel was I was getting fed up seeing stuff online that didn't represent me, like women in general. Sure. You know, even though it's like since then I've come to terms with, oh, yeah, I'm actually non-binary. But since my history has been being presented as a woman and being treated by society as a woman, that's where my perspective comes from a lot of the time. And I just remember getting so mad at some of the panels that I was watching. And there was one in particular, and I won't say who it is because I know he's a really nice guy and he has um, a following online and stuff, and he's known for being really nice. So I know he didn't mean anything by it, but it was back during when Chrissy Blasey Ford had to go up in front of everyone and just talk about that horrendous event in her life. And then that, struck me down to the core like that whole situation was just triggering me like crazy yeah and then there's this one guy and he has two or three other men on his show and they're talking about how women think of consent <laughs> i just kind of not lost. qualified <laughs> i just kind of <clears throat> i am so fed up of having conversations about a group of people that don't include that group of people. Right. Like people who will talk about trans rights without ever having somebody who is trans on their show. Or they're talking about how women think of consent without having a woman on their show. Or talking about, well, this will offend this blank group of people. And it's like, why don't you just try talking to them? Because there's been times I've been screaming on my screen at something because I'm part of a group they're talking about and they're making up all these wild assumptions and stuff. And I'm like, would you just talk to me? There are people, maybe not me, but there's lots of people out there that are more than willing to put in their input into this. And so I was just yeah. getting so mad with that. I'm like, you know what? I should probably just do my own political show because I know not enough women or people presenting as women get into the political sphere, get into talking about politics. And yeah, and you're doing that, it well. Yeah, yeah. It's very well done. Uh, Just because you don't have like an immediate mass yeah. following, that doesn't mean you aren't doing it, right? Thank you. You know, it's taking not the same. In, taking, I have a harder time taking compliments in public than I do insults. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this isn't the same because you're you're coming from a more personal place. But every time I hear Emma Vigelin talk about movies, I want to call her and talk about sports just to show her what it's like to have somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about pontificate mm -hmm. on just from opinion based standpoints rather than evidence based standpoints. Yeah. And I just yeah, there's so many times and plus the type of people the communities i hang around have a very diverse group of people when it comes to sexual orientation identities and things of that sort so i know almost every time somebody who's personally being affected by conversations that are about them but don't include them yeah and sometimes bad. and sometimes it's me and i just kind of <sighs> and so that was part of my frustration and part of the reason why i wanted to get on here but also I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It's going to happen where I am going to start getting attacked and harassed and things of that sort. But I find for some reason I slip under the radar a lot of the time because I've been in situations where people are like, oh, in this position, you're going to get hit on a lot. Not once, you know, or if you do blank, this is going to happen. Or if you do blank, this is going to happen. Like I've been on you know, sites where women are constantly complaining about the men who are sending unsolicited emails and harassing them. And it's like, no, nah, I don't, I don't get that. Like it just, some, sometimes there needs to be like a pile on situation mm -hmm. where enough people have to do it for everyone else to feel comfortable being equally negative. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, um, and, and this is, I don't know if it's controversial, but it might not be accurate on a case by case basis, but Maybe you're intimidating to them. Maybe they know if they go after you, 
you'll go back because we're artists. Mm -hmm. We can draw you pretty messed up if we want to. If anyone's messing with me, I don't, you better hope you don't have pictures of yourself online Yeah. because I'll draw you and take you down and everyone will see it. And what are you going to do about it? Well, for me, it's not so much the artistic aspect of it, but I've been told by plenty of men that part of the reason why they will never approach me is I am intimidating for them for some reason that I come across as basically I come across as not afraid to turn them down or to speak my mind. And I'm thinking it's a pretty sad state in this world. If a woman that who right. will actually speak her <clears throat> mind is intimidating. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you never hear, Oh, I love you so much. Can you please be quiet from now? No one ever says that. <laughs> It's like you're just putting on a different face for different situations. And I think when people seem to shut down, it's because their lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. And that could be how they perceive you or it could be how you want to be perceived, like how, how you project. So I think like, like, again, here I make a decision where it's like, I just don't care. It could be there could be any number of contributing factors to why somebody acts the way they do or says what they say. And if the only time I really um, re respond is when it's a matter of disrespect. If somebody is outright disrespecting me, well, I've made up my mind years ago that I demand to be respected in those cases and I will confront you. But um, as long as I can hit mute, <laughs> Yeah. It makes the world pretty easy to just, you know, forget about it. But I get that some people can't do that. Yeah. So I imagine at some point it's going to happen where people will actually start harassing me and doing things. But I'm still so new at this point. It's not happening. So it gives me a lot more freedom. I'm not afraid to say anything because I don't really have to worry about that. But again, it's part of that two minds thing, because at the same time, I'm still very worried that one little slip up and everyone will pile on me and sink me. So it's, it's constantly two minds about everything and I am aware of it, but generally speaking in my life, I've gone under the radar unnoticed. I don't get the same attention or harassment a lot of other people get for whatever reason. And I don't know what it is. And I'm hoping that at least translates long enough online that I can actually get that fan base going. But I think part of it is too, people are more they have more empathy than they realize. They're more intuitive than they realize. And a lot of people can be put off by other people and not realize what's doing it. And part of it with me is if I go after you for something, if we get into a conversation because you're going after me and then I'm like, okay, let's, let's deal with this. We're not having a debate. I will dig into your surface and pull out what is hurting you to figure out, okay, this is what it's about. It's not about me. Right. It's about this element. And I have a really good knack of digging through that surface and getting there. And that's why when I see these online debates about issues and stuff like that, I'm like, I will never be doing those. Because to me, my immediate pull is, why are you trying to hurt people? Like with a lot of like the anti-vaxxers and especially the people who know vaccines work, but still push it. I just look at them or they come across as so negative and you can just see it radiating off of them. They're not happy people. And so for me, that's kind of the angle I am suddenly drawn to. It's like, why are you expressing yourself this way? Why are you bringing out this negativity? And part of it is because I want to help. I have too much compassion. And so even if it's a really horrible person, and they're doing horrible things, I know it's because they're in a lot of pain themselves too a lot of the time. And part of me just wants to kind of go in and get at that. So for me to be in a debate with a lot of people, even if I know my facts and things of that sort, that's not the angle I would want to go. And I, a lot of people, they don't want to deal with that. They, they'd much yeah. rather people just call them names and yell at them and do all this sort of stuff as opposed to say, you know what? I care about you. That's mm -hmm. a lot harder for people to take. Or at least you understand, like I was saying, there's too many contributing factors for me to try and guess mm -hmm. um, to, to sit in judgment. 
Yeah. And I really, it's difficult for me to say there, I found a bad person. Mm -hmm. You found somebody who did something awful maybe, or something bad, but what got them to that point? Mm -hmm. Who should have been held accountable along the way that wasn't? Yeah. that ended up resulting in this bad thing happening. Yeah. And so that's where, like when it comes to, um, uh, what do you call it? Like criminal reform, I, I'm sympathetic. And I think that there is something to be said for that. But while at the same time, there are some crimes that are just too great, right? And, Have you and, seen my video on restorative justice? <laughs> right. And, and you can tell when somebody is like in a position of power and abusing the power. Mm -hmm. But this is why I, you know, the phrase speak truth to power. I always amend that. I don't speak truth to power without looking for the truth in somebody. Mm -hmm. Because speaking truth to power isn't just yelling at the people in, in powerful positions. I'm always trying to make sure that I'm in the right lane mm -hmm. and that I'm taking the right position. And if there is anything in their decision that I disagree with that could contribute to why they made that decision, I'd like to hear it. Mm -hmm. And that will help me further analyze whether I should be against you or more sympathetic. Mm -hmm. More often than not, speaking truth to power is being against the people in power and telling them how they screwed up. But there are cases where circumstance come into play and it's like, OK, well, you just you made a decision based on these contributing factors. I didn't know that previously. I do now. I'll look at it differently. I might not have a different opinion or outcome, but I'll look at it differently. And that's self-improvement. Yeah. So I think speaking truth to power is also looking for the truth in people. Yeah. I, I want to open this, uh, this drawing. Yeah. It's been, it's been was, in my possession yeah, too long. I was just about to get to that. And it's like, right, we need to actually get to the grand <laughs> finale of this talk. So to recap or to kind of tie in what we were talking about at the very beginning, um, I had offered you a drawing, but you didn't want those ones. So I'm like, I'm just going to draw your dog. So, I wanted them. <laughs> I wanted them. I wasn't going to let you send them in the mail, but I, I did want them. Sure. Yeah. So I drew a picture of your dog and I have sent it to you and you have not seen it yet. You have seen the online digital image that I've taken with my camera, but you have not actually seen the drawing yet. So yeah, here, I wonder, am I going to need scissors for this? Um, you might need to cut some tape. There's a lot of painter's tape, but then there's some actual like tape tape but you will find out all right sorry for any like paper noise <laughs> yeah There's as you rip card. the drawing in half is that the i haven't opened this i haven't opened this at all should <laughs> i i'll save the card yeah. want me to you can save the card you don't need to read the card now that's for sure this is very the packaging is perfect yeah. by the way oh and did you see there's something else in there did you see that yeah there's a smaller, it's like a bottle. Yeah. So there's a story with that. Um, my well, grandmother, yeah, my grandmother, she used to do uh, this marbling technique that I wish I knew how she did it because it's so amazing. Oh my gosh. And yeah, so. Wow. She's also done things like this. They're like little eggs. Oh, I love that. Out. And I wish one of the biggest regrets i have and they're even like up to this size here it's signed on the oh wow that's huge it's signed on the inside one of the things that i wish i had found out from her before she passed away was how to do that and there's only a limited amount of these things left in the world because she kind of took this technique with her wow so this is when so I, cool so when i give gift one of these it's done with the most sincerity and caringness in the world because it will never be made again. It will never. How be old is this? She made it probably in the seventies. <laughs> Come on, this is like I have to be careful with this. I'm going to put it back in the bubble right now, <laughs> just so I find sturdy. a place. To keep... Yeah, they're pretty sturdy, but she did all these wonderful marbled objects, and I wish I knew how she did it. To all the artists out there, myself included, this is how you package artwork appropriately. I do not do it this well. Mm -hmm. It's labeled top. <laughs> I don't, I always cross my, I sent like 
I don't know, hundreds of dollars worth of art to a guy in Denmark. And I was like, did it show up okay? And he's like, yeah, it's fine. And I was like, okay, because there's a chance it could have been totally destroyed. <laughs> I, I get so paranoid about it. That's why I packed it so intensely. Because yeah, then there's, is... um, it's windowed out, so there's nothing actually touching the surface of the drawing. Oh. Good grief. You had nothing to worry about. Oh. It's on the one hand, so this is a testament to your ability as an artist. As soon as I looked at it, I was like, there's my cute little puppy. <laughs> so you nailed that. <laughs> this is great. You're, there's no way any tape is going to get on this or anything. You did really well, really, really well. You should hold it up to the camera. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Let me. Yeah. Wow. Look at this. Can you see that? Yeah. It's perfect. It's the kind of thing I'm going to look at for a long time. Oh, it's so good. And you wrote Coda on there. Mm -hmm. And I should have my glasses. So you wrote Coda on there, but you didn't write it. You drew it with micro scribbles. Yes. Right? It's kind of like. Um... The same how technique I was that? using for the grass. Oh, how do you get that detailed? I have all these technical questions. Okay, your anxiety <laughs> is kind of justified because <laughs> this is so much, like you said, you get a third of the way before you feel okay with it. A third of the way here is a lot of work. That's a tremendous amount of work. So I would have... I, this is probably why I don't do this <laughs> because I can't hit undo mm -hmm. or I can't get out some white out like that. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't work. This is amazing. Okay. The, so one of the things I noticed immediately, which you can't really analyze till you get up close is your use of negative space or like leaving certain things unillustrated. Like, um, Mm -hmm. this fur right here or the basic outline in general like not drawing certain things is often for me more challenging than drawing things like knowing what not to do it's like in a film score the use of silence how do you know how to do how do you know when not to have music like that to me is really challenging this but you've done it you nailed it in this, in, in the original photo, I don't know if you can tell this now looking at it, but she was listening to my wife inside handling car keys. Mm -hmm. And so this is her being like, I might be going for a drive in the car. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. It's so good. I can only imagine if people don't record their reactions, I can only imagine it's a similar reaction. There's no way somebody's going to get this and immediately discard it. Yeah, it's, I just, I never know, but I'm just glad that, okay, the packaging worked. <laughs> like that, to me, part of seeing the drawing itself is just to know it arrived the way I sent it. I'm going to leave it in this um, window packaging until I get a suitable frame. Like, so not only did it work, but it's, uh, it's, it, it has, um, it goes beyond its original function. <laughs> it's not packaging anymore. Now it's helping me preserve the art. So this is fantastic. Protection. Yeah. Wow. Really good. Thank you so much. Well, without you, I wouldn't have had that ability to do that drawing. So. Well, and so that's why, so I, my original, I don't know if I ever said this to anyone, my original idea for, you know, it was my birthday. So I say, mm -hmm. Hey, if you want to give me, cause everyone's like, Oh, happy birthday, like on Twitter and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't really know. You don't have to say that. But I was like, if anybody wants to give me anything, how about you draw something for a change? And it was kind of like, let's see who the real artists are here. But on the other hand, I want people to make art. So part of the reason I make comics is to encourage people to make comics. And so I was like, just give me some art. And like, there were YouTubers making art of other YouTubers. 
And I was like, okay, now that's going to get people into it. And then Sam said something on his show. And I was like, well, now that's going to get more people into it. So now I'm kind of obligated to do it again. But my reasons are completely different. Now it's like, I, I just want other people to have an opportunity to get in on this fun thing that we all did last year on my birthday. So isn't it funny how that stuff comes around? It's like, yeah, I didn't, I just fired off a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think anybody was going to do anything. And now it's like, let's make it annual, you know? Yeah. And it's like, not only that, it's just, it's a simple little tweet. And yet it changed my life. Well, that was, that's the biggest reward. If somebody can say that, then, <clears throat> you know, it's not like I walk around with this level of power <laughs> where I know I can do this. Um, but if that happens, then mission accomplished, really, because like I was saying, I just wanted people to make more art. So if that means awakening something inside of somebody that should not have been dormant, then let's go, you know, then I, I have to do it. I should probably do it more than once a year then, but I don't want it to seem, you know, in genuine. That's fantastic. It's very good. I'll be looking at this for an hour. And just so you know, all the art in my house that's up on the walls is by other people. <clears throat> like I have art in my house. I don't even really like that. I put up because somebody gave it to me <laughs> and, and I figure somebody's going to like it. Right. It's just more art. That's not bad. But this will be perfect. I got to find the perfect spot for this. It's probably going to go in my office, which is if my home were like its own world, my office would be the part of the world where you're required to get shots before traveling to. <laughs> well, everyone needs a vaccine now, but you yeah. know what I mean? So because it's just kind of messy back there, but the mm -hmm. stuff on the wall is most precious. Mm -hmm. So like if somebody gets back there and has a chance to see it, it's like a big deal. So. But once you frame it, you can put it anywhere. But thanks. This is great. I love it. Wow. OK, well, thank you. Well, and I love it more than I did seeing it digitally. Just just yeah. so you know, <laughs> I think they look better with your eyeballs. <laughs> Yeah, and definitely. Then I find they do look very different up close versus, you know, putting it down somewhere and stepping back. Because up yeah. close, you see like these fine little details or something looks a little bit blurry. But then when you step away, it kind of all kind of. There's a word there that I just totally forgot what it is. I know what you mean, though. It's it's. um. When I was in apparel design, we would put small details on it. And if you were five feet away, you couldn't see them. This encourages people to get up and close with these things because you can see something's there, but you can't make it out. So now you have to get closer. You have to approach and that, and then you're kind of hooked, right? It's the same with, I'm not a big car guy, but I go to car shows because I like to walk around cars and look for small decals that represent a tour around Europe in 1983 or whatever it is. Um, there's all these little details that you can't see unless you're up close. And then that makes you wonder, why is it there? Who put it there? What was their thinking? And now, and now you can explore the whole world through a new lens just because you, you took a time to um, consider something that was probably considered, which is, mm -hmm. you know, that's to me, that's what makes the world go around. And that's why people create. But thanks again. I love it. Oh, thank you. There was so much more. I was thinking, oh, we're going to be talking about we didn't even touch on politics or <clears throat> that's your, not comic, bad. <laughs> your comic book, the Kickstarter. We didn't even mention that. Well, that's over. <laughs> yeah, I know it's over for you, but I'm still waiting for my copy. Oh, I'd be glad to come on anytime. Yeah. So. Yeah, there were still like some other things. I'm like, oh, we should have talked about blank because I wouldn't mind knowing more about the actual experience of a Kickstarter for maybe other people, you know, other people, how that whole thing goes, <laughs> you know, uh, there's two, or, there's, there's three major rules that I've learned in hindsight, but we, only three. Yeah. But we've been talking for so long now. I think yeah. we just have an excuse for another conversation. Yeah, I love it. That'd be great. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on, and I look forward to many more of these chats. Thanks. Me too. 
I hope you enjoyed our discussion. I'm sure that's just the first of many, many more discussions we'll be having covering a large array of topics. Salut, à la prochaine. Thank you for watching and stay tuned. I'm Sandy, wishing your tomorrow is better than your today.